Stand by for action. When Papa stepped forward, he was cut down by his own police department. Telling the truth destroyed his career. The top cop who put his badge on the line for justice. Sometimes the truth has a price. That may be the lesson of a Virginia police officer who says, in trying to do the right thing, he ended up paying for it. One man who confronted truth and consequences. Welcome to Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa. Episode 39 for Friday, January 29th, 2021. On May 7th, 2018, I conducted an on-the-record recorded telephonic interview with Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiason. At the time of that interview, my investigative stories were being published by the online media outlet, the Baltimore Post-Examiner. On January 21st, 2019, the contents of my interview with Judge Tobiason was published by the Baltimore Post-Examiner in a story that was titled, quote, Judge claims FBI refused information on police corruption probe after pressure from LVMPD, unquote. After that story and several follow-up stories that I authored, the publisher included links to a few audio excerpts from my recorded interview with Judge Tobiason. In late January 2019, I severed my relationship with the Baltimore Post-Examiner, and subsequently in May of 2019, I premiered the first episode of my podcast series, Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa. I have continued my investigations involving Judge Tobiason and the unsolved 2016 Las Vegas Land Kaufman double homicide, based on comments that were made by Judge Tobiason during my recorded interview with her in 2018, and other information that I have since uncovered. Tobiason made serious allegations against the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the Las Vegas Division of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Clark County District Attorney's Office, as many of you are aware of that have been following my investigative journalism for the past few years. In January of 2021, per their request, I turned over to the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline a complete audio recording of my interview with Judge Tobiason. Several audio excerpts of that interview, as I stated previously, had already been published by the editor of the Baltimore Post-Examiner at the time, and more recently, by myself and several of my podcasts. Now, in this podcast, for the first time, I will publish the entire unedited audio recording of my interview with Judge Tobiason, as it was recorded on May 7th of 2018. The Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline, according to court documents, turned over to Judge Tobiason and her counsel in 2019 a copy of the audio recording that I gave the commission, including a transcript of that recording that was made by the Judicial Commission. I reviewed that transcript, and it is substantially correct, and the entire transcript can be viewed on the screenshots contained in this podcast. My conversation with Judge Tobias on May 7, 2018, was made using my cell phone on speaker, the audio of which was recorded into a computer using an external microphone, so there is some background noise. And now, here is the entire interview. It is approximately one hour and 52 minutes in length. Thank you for listening. It's Monday, May 7th, 2018. Time is 18.59 hours. This is Doug Pop, investigative reporter for the Baltimore Post-Examiner. Yes, ma'am, this is uh, Doug from the Baltimore Post-Examiner. Before we start talking, mm -hmm. I have to advise you that the telephone conversation is recorded. You okay with that? Okay. Okay, and while we're talking... Not entirely, but that's okay. I understand why. Okay, do you have a problem with me recording the, the conversation? It's okay. Go ahead. Okay. During our conversation, I do not want you to name the police sources who told you to, that I was going to contact you. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. Can you um give me your name? Can, can you state your name and then your position in Clark County? Can I ask you what purpose your recording will be used for? Well, the recording is for your protection and it's my protection because what I believe. You go. go ahead. 
you don't plan on using it though well, of, of course I'm going to use what you tell me if if I end up doing a story, which I don't know if I'm going to. I understand to. that. Not so, the actual recording, though. No, am I going to use your recording in my story? Yeah. No, I'm going to use what you tell me. If I, if I, listen, if I, Thank you. if I end up. I don't up, mean to be difficult. I'm just saying, you know. Okay, if I end up doing a story after we talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use what you tell me in the recording okay. as, as a basis for my story. Gotcha. Okay. Um, can you just state... All right. My name is Melody Andrews Tobias, and I'm a Las Vegas Justice of the, uh, Justice of the Peace in Las Vegas, Nevada. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I need you to ask you a question, Melody. Just don't take offense to it. Um, is there anybody present with you while we're talking? No. Just my dog's jumping on me. <laughs> okay. And um, are you under the influence of alcohol or any medications, legal or illegal, while we're talking? No. No, no sir. Okay. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to explain to me what's going on in chronological order, if that's possible, and then I may interrupt you or ask you questions at the end. But I want to give you a chance to explain to me, like, I don't know what's going on, try to do it in, in um, a chronological order, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Is, that, is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. I will tell you that one of my kids is home, and if he comes downstairs, I'll let you know. And I may have to cut it short. We may have to do it in two stories. This is a very long story, but I will at least start. Okay. Okay, Melanie, go ahead. Let me so, ask. Let me ask you a question before you start. What is yeah. your? What do you do as a justice of the peace judge? What is your job? What kind of cases do you handle? I handle criminal cases. The last six years, I've handled domestic violence cases in Clark County. Um, what that entails is every single misdemeanor and felony domestic violence case that involves an intimate relationship. And for the last two years, those that involve not, uh, not just intimate relationships, but also non-intimate relationships, such as, um, you know, parent-child, siblings, things of that nature. Um, all criminal, we have probably the largest caseload in the country. We do um, initial arraignments on all the misdemeanors and felonies that happen in Clark County. We do felony preliminary hearings, misdemeanor trials, sentencing on misdemeanors, and um, status checks on all cases that are negotiated in front of us to misdemeanors. Okay. So felonies that are reduced to misdemeanors, etc. Okay. Start telling me in a chrono chronological order, if possible, what 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 is going on with with you and the police department and what we what uh, the cops told me about what's going on. Okay. Uh, my involvement in this started about the summer of 2015. I, as a justice of the peace, had a case in front of me where a judge's daughter was a victim of a brutal beating by two female defendants. It turns out that those two defendants worked for a pimp by the name of Shane Valentine, as did the judge's daughter. Um, the pimp who was at the scene of the initial beating and was actually directing the girls to inflict the beating on this judge's daughter was never charged. Um, one of the two girls, whose name was Sophia Faraci, died prior to the preliminary hearing. She was the daughter of a guy by the name of Vinnie Faraci, who went to federal prison with a guy by the name of Rick Rizzolo. Faraci, uh, his dad or family were enforcers for the Gambino crime family, which is interesting considering his daughter was a prostitute for Shane Valentine, who initially I thought was just some thug. Um, so we have the preliminary hearing. In the middle of the preliminary hearing, four African American guys come in, sit in the back row, and start, you know, staring at the the judge's daughter who's testifying, and I kicked them out of my courtroom and in fact had them escorted out of the entire courthouse. One of those people was Shane Valentine. At the time, my daughter was a sophomore at Bishop Foreman High School here in Las Vegas, and she was very good friends with a girl, um, also the, a sophomore, whose dad was a police officer at Metro. This girl, from what I understand, and I didn't know at the time, but I subsequently learned, was also working as a prostitute for Shane Valentine. So we've got a judge's daughter and a police officer's daughter. 
somehow Shane Valentine becomes aware that I have a daughter. And within about two weeks of that hearing, my daughter is introduced to Shane Valentine by the other girl, um, the police officer's daughter that was her friend. So about July of 2015, my daughter starts hanging out at a place in what we call Chinatown here in Las Vegas called Top Notch. It was a hip hop clothing store that when I looked into it, realized it was not really a clothing store. It was a front for an unlicensed club. And also that they on a regular basis had young local high school girls hanging out in the club. Um, dancing, there were strip, there were stripper poles in the back of the club. There was a full bar. There were, you know, at night, if you watch the alley behind the club, you would see the people come in, you know, typical Mercedes, Range Rovers, Bentleys, Rolls Royce, whatever. They'd all pull in and you'd see the, the people that were getting out and you could see exactly what was going on. They'd go in through the alley back door and it was in fact an unlicensed club. Um, so in July of 2015, I start contacting detectives in Bryce, asking them about this particular establishment. They tell me they have no knowledge of it whatsoever. I gather some additional information, find out that the two men who are running this club, both are convicted pimps, and uh, one of whom has had a case in front of me. He was a 34-year-old. I take that information to the police. I say, listen, these guys are caught young girls from, you know, local high schools hanging out in here every night. And from my understanding, they're entertaining in this unlicensed club. And at one point, one of the vice officers apparently walked in there about two o'clock in the afternoon, when I can assure you there was no activity going on, and reports back to me that it definitely appears to be suspicious. That's the only thing that was ever done in the entire year and three months or so that I was giving information to Vice. They never follow up. They never do anything else. Um, so my daughter at some point says she's going to start working here. I tell her, you know, I make it very clear. It is not a legitimate business. And I make it very clear that she's risking a lot for our family by hanging out with these kind of people. I also am in a very precarious position because doing everything I can to keep it so that we have a relationship and I don't alienate her. So what I do is I allow her to go and work there, but I watch it. I sit, I watch while she's there. And after about three weeks, she says she doesn't want to go back and I tell her, good, don't go back. Um, so, but from my understanding, even after that, you know, occasionally she would hang out there. They would go hang out in the club. It was kind of like a hookah lounge slash strip club. Um, so I continue to tell the police this. I watch the back alley. I get license plate numbers, vehicle makes the models, tell them what's going on, get the information on Marlon Brown and Red and, uh, you know, express my concern repeatedly that there are 30 something year old pimps running this unlicensed club with all these underage girls hanging out there. And, the, and it's interestingly enough, the first time that I took the information to the police, I wasn't so concerned because I figured within a week, the police would be shut down. Well, clearly that didn't happen because I subsequently learned that not only did the police know about this place when I first started giving them information, they knew about a lot of places like this. And they were kind of untouchable. There were certain pits that were untouchable. And then there were certain pits that they would go after. The pits that were untouchable, from my understanding, is the pits who would play the game. They would pay the price. They would, you know, offer their girls. And they would get to do whatever they wanted, despite the fact that they were targeting, you know, judges, daughters, cops, daughters, etc. I learned pretty quickly that Shane Valentine was also untouchable. No matter what I said to the police about him, they never went after him. Um, so this is about September. This goes into September, October of 2015. 
then my daughter kind of quits hanging out there. Occasionally she would go there, but mostly she wasn't going there. Um, December of 2015, I still continued to give information, even when my daughter was no longer going there. So they figured not just my daughter that was in, in jeopardy. December 2015, my daughter comes to me, says to me that she met a guy the night before. She went to his house, apparently was sent to him by the people at Top Notch to get a fake ID, or at least by people she had met at Top Notch. That person was Shane Valentine. Now, she had met him, but she'd not really had much interaction with him. Um, on this particular night, she goes over there to get a fake ID, and he starts, you know, talking the talk, and I just kind of given her a heads up about what that would sound like and what that would look like. And he starts talking the talk and tells her that he's going to teach her how to, that she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, and he was going to teach her how to work the strip, and she was going to make money for him. And she said, no, that's not my thing. I'm not doing that. There were some pretty choice words exchanged between the two, and then the next morning she advised me of what had happened, and I was very grateful that, thank God, she was home safe, and we had a lengthy conversation about, again, the risks that she was taking hanging out with these kinds of people and what it would require of me if one of them were to get her. I then immediately contacted Vice again, and this was probably the fifth or sixth time I had contacted them in this particular period of time, July to December of 2015, contacted them immediately, gave them his name, the address where she had gone, the fact that he had drugs and guns in the house and he was an ex-felon, and the conversation that he had had with my daughter, and the fact that it was clear that he was also had a, that he also had other girls working for him. Uh, not, they, they did nothing. They said they would look into it. Um, I subsequently learned that not only did they know who he was, he was pretty much untouchable, and they never even queried the address because they never had any intention of going after him. For a long period of time, I thought it was just they were lazy or they judged me because, you know, they figured, why is she letting her daughter do this? Um, you know, my theory was they should understand that when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you try to do everything in your power to keep your child talking to you. Because the minute you alienate them, you basically send them into the lion's den. Um, February, that scared my daughter. And I would say starting then, she really started um, separating herself from the hookah lounges and these after hours clubs and was kind of breaking away from that. February of 2016, Shane Valentine is caught on video very, very close to my house doing a residential burglary. When he wasn't pimping out girls or selling dope, he was burglarizing houses. And in fact, a lieutenant at Metro at one point had told me that he was, they thought he was good for at least 600 burglaries. During the time while he, he was on out on bail for this particular burglary I'm about to tell you about, we get caught on surveillance camera, and they put a warrant out for him. Now, prior to that, there had been six burglaries in my neighborhood that were same MO, same description. I went to the burglary detectives, and I advised them. I believed he had done those, um, and also told them, you know, about the situation with my daughter, about the situation with these other girls, and they did nothing. I mean, he did get arrested for the one burglary where he was on tape, but they did no follow-up on the other burglaries. <clears throat> Nobody ever attempted to get a search warrant for his house, despite the fact that there was, you know, there were people who could say they saw guns and drugs, etc., in the house. Uh, at this time, when they issued the arrest warrant for him, I learned that he's got an outstanding bench warrant on a domestic violence case in front of me where he beat up a girl at a place called Panorama Towers, which is notorious for pimp and prostitution activity, clear from the facts of the case that she was a prostitute working for him. Um, 
He beats her up, security guard comes to her aid, he then leaves, sends her pictures of him with guns, threatens to kill her, says she's never going to be safe. Um, she gives a statement to the police basically that, you know, she's terrified, she's afraid to leave her house because she's so afraid he's going to kill her. Um, May of 2016, Shane Valentine gets picked up on those warrants, um, bails out on the burglary case, pleads guilty to the battery domestic violence case in front of me, and I recuse, but during that conversation, I had brought counsel into my chambers to explain to them, you know, the circumstances around this guy and my concerns with, for my daughter, right. and the DA at that time says to me, Judge, this is the guy who picked out the other judge's daughter. Who was that DA? Who was that before. DA's name? Who was that DA? That was Hagar Trapiti. She just happened to remember that he was the one on the other case, that he was the pimp, that even though he wasn't charged, she remembered his name. I had never made the connection until that moment. Now, Mind you, I am telling the police about Shane now for six months. And then I think, then I learned this detail and I freak out because now I realize, because I always had believed he was targeting certain types of girls or certain families. Now I knew for sure. So I called Vice again and I said, I have just learned that he is the same guy who pimped out the other judge's daughter. And they, seem to be shocked. However, I now know that they knew exactly who he was and exactly who he had pissed out when I first gave his information to them. They knew he was the guy who had picked out this judge's daughter. They knew they, he had never been charged. They had never submitted a case on him and they'd never gone after him. Uh -huh. So let's see. About a month later, he comes back to court, and I I had taken the plea on the case. Because the case was negotiated, I had taken the plea, and I had explained to the attorney that though there was, you know, I was con there was a conflict, and I would never put him in jail, I didn't want to recuse because I wasn't sure if he was aware of the relationship. Both parties agreed that since the case was negotiated and it was just a misdemeanor that I would take the plea. And if there was ever a time that the time needed to be imposed, I would, you know, recuse. By the first status check, I had decided that I was going to recuse anyway, because there was nothing good for me being on this case. And I had learned some other information by that time. So when he comes back for his first status check, I recuse. Later that day, he starts contacting my daughter from a blocked phone number. She had not heard from him for some time, probably since the warrant went out in February. So she calls me immediately. She says, it was Shane in court today. I said, yes, he was. She said, he'd been contacting me. So he called her two or three times from two or three different numbers. The first time he called, she said, who or she he texted, messaged her. She said, who is this? He said, it's Sugar. That's Sugar Shane. She blocks him. He then messages her from another number, basically, why the fuck are you going to do that? She blocks him again. I can't remember if he did a third number or if it was just the two, but she contacted me immediately. I then called Vice, and I told them, who'd you, again. Ma'am, uh, who'd you talk to in Vice? Who are the detectives you're talking to? On that, the, the majority of the time I spoke to detectives Blues and BS. That would be Kelly Blues and Al BS. Little did I know at this time that they were both subjects of the federal investigation. I had no idea because right. it hadn't been made public yet. Um, so then I, I had also talked to Kathy Healy. I had talked to Greg Flores. I had talked to several others, you know, in passing. But those were the blue, BS and Blues were the ones I took most of the information to. But I had given information to Flores and I had given information to Healy. Um, I also had talked to um, a detective by the name of Van Cleef. But, um, so at this time I call Blue and Biaz again. And I tell them that he was in court. And as soon as he left my court, he started contacting my daughter. I go, I don't understand why you guys won't do anything. 
And so um, there's this part, I mean, I'll say it, and I know it's being recorded, but, you know, at the point that this story gets reported, there's certain things that, you know, hopefully we can talk about not discussing just for my daughter's protection, you know? Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I contacted his attorney because it was now going on a year that I had been calling advice and that they had done zero, absolutely nothing. So... Uh, do we, I ma'am, ma'am, hold on for a second. Before you go any further, I don't, I don't want you to lose track. But could, can you um, phonetically spell the names of the as best you can of the vice cops you spoke to? I know Al B S is B E A S, but who were the others? That's correct. Kelly Booth is K E L L Y B L U T H. He is a man. His wife is a uh, prostitute. She's a DA. Her name is Jacqueline Booth. Um, then there's Kathy Huey. Kathy, I think, is with a C and not a K, and then last name is H-U-I. Gregory Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. Greg Flores is one of the most corrupt individuals I've ever had the displeasure of learning about. Um, then there was a Van Cleef, and I'm sorry, I don't know his first name. It's V-A-N-B-L-E-E-F. Okay. So I contact Shane Valentine's attorney. It's about July now of 2016. And because I know that the cops at this point aren't going to do anything. I call his attorney and I said, hey, you might want to get your client a message that if he talks to my, if he calls my daughter again, I'm going to take care of it myself. <laughs> so he does. He gives him the message. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, we don't really want to report that. But you know, I was at the point where I thought, if this guy's going to continue to mess with my daughter, clearly the police don't give a shit. They're not going to protect her. I spent a year trying to get them to do some sort of independent investigation and shut these places down. That I had given them, Shane Valentine was associated with a place called Milk Money, which is the same kind of thing as Top Notch. You know, it's like a front. They use all these clothing stores and strip malls and at area malls that look like clothing stores from the front, but they're actually unlicensed clubs. And they're all over town. Milk money is, from my understanding, from talking to people in the industry, is owned and run by Molly Mall. That should explain some things to you, because Shane Valentine was associated with milk money. Molly Mall's people, in other words, pimps that worked under Molly Mall's permission, were pretty much untouchable. Just like Ocean Fleming and Raymond Sharp said. So, which explains why they never ever went after Shane Valentine. So, he does get charged with the burglary, kind of hard not to since it's on videotape and they put it all over the news. Um, and, so while he's out on bail, on that burglary and while I continue to go to the police and while he continues to harass my daughter, the police continue to do nothing. During that time, from what I understand, he's still pimping out girls, he's still selling dope, and he's still burglarizing houses. Um, it was well known among the kids, you know, the teenagers who hung out in this little group of people that hung out at the hookah lounges that Shane and a kid named Neo were doing burglaries. That's, um, Oh, I get it. Hold I'll come up with Neil's last name in a minute. Sometimes it escapes me. Um, but, uh, so, sorry. So this is summer. My daughter was actually doing very well. She was working at, you know, a regular place, doing really well, had a different group of friends, was not involved with the stuff. But I continued to push it because... At any time, there were several times I had conversations with Blue where he'd say, well, what's going on with your daughter? And I'd say, my daughter's fine. And he goes, well, what do you want us to do? And I go, well, just because my daughter's fine doesn't mean other people's daughters are fine. I said, this isn't just about my kid. This is about everyone's kids. So um, September 26th of 2016, it was a Sunday. I get a search warrant call from homicide. About halfway through the search warrant, we do telephonic search warrants here. About halfway through the search warrant, they give the address and the name of the location of the homicide. 
that location was Top Notch Clothing Store, the place that I had started to talk to Vice about July of 2015. It's now September 2016. Um, so Top Notch was still going strong as an after hours club with underage girls. And lo and behold, there's a murder there. So I get off the phone, I call, I call the Vice Sergeant, or I'm sorry, the Homicide Sergeant back and I explained to him that you know, I was concerned about my name being on the search warrant because these people knew who I was and they had kind of tried to get their hooks into my daughter. Um, but they had, you know, most likely gotten their hooks into other girls. Well, Ma'am, before you and, go any further, let me interrupt you. Where, where was Top Notch located at? At this point in time, Top, Top Notch had moved. When I first, when my daughter first was aware of it and I was first aware of it, it was on Spring Mountain. I can get you the full addresses, but it was on Spring Mountain, and it was uh, between Valley View and Arville in what we call Chinatown. And then by the time it had the murder, the murder was there. It had moved to a location at the corner of Flamingo and Decatur, and it was on the southeast corner in a strip mall behind like a Blueberry Hill breakfast restaurant and stuff like that, it was a little strip mall. And again, I can get you the full addresses okay. um, if you need them. So the murder happens there. They have surveillance cameras and interestingly enough, they, the homicide guys call me and ask me if I'll show the pictures of these four people to my daughter. And I said, are you out of your mind? I said, there is no way in God's green earth that I'm going to have my daughter identify the shooter and the getaway driver in this video for you guys to, you know, I mean, they haven't protected her to this point. And she was like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to use my daughter as your guinea pig. So, which turned out to be a really smart move on my part. Ultimately, they identified the shooter. They identified the getaway driver. And the attorney for the guy who was the driver of the car that the shooter jumped into had set up a meeting with homicide. She's my, one of my best friends. So she had set up a meeting with them and said her client was willing to talk to them off the record. Well, homicide comes in to interview the guy. He identifies the shooter for them, but it was agreed prior to the conversation that they would not, you know, use his name. Well, guess what they did? They recorded it, transcribed it, and submitted it to the DA's office in discovery, basically sealing this guy's death warrant. So they burned her completely. Well, and, what, was her, what, was the, what was the name of that person? Pardon me? What was the name of that person? Antoine Bernard. That's the one that they fingered, right? That's, no, Antoine Bernard was the one who talked to him and gave them the name of the shooter. The shooter's name, I, I have it all, but it, I don't have it off the top of my head. I'll have to get it for you because I have a whole file that's like four feet thick. Okay. Um, and I don't have it sitting in front of me. But I can, I'll get you the name of the shooter. I mean, he went to prison. He got convicted of the murder because Antoine Bernard didn't have a choice but to testify against him because they basically <laughs> gave the shooter the discovery with his name in it, even though they said they would never do that. So... Um, Antoine Bernard, the DA's office, agreed to probation for him, and there was a guest, you know, a, a visiting judge, because the other judge was on vacation, and gave him prison time, and nobody ever did anything, let him go to prison. I'm surprised he didn't get murdered there, but he is out of prison now. Anyway, so that was October 26th. The following day, which was a Monday, I contact Detective Blues, and I'm pissed. I said to him, I go, I, I said, I assume you heard about the murder at Top Notch. I'm not quite sure why you have blown me off for all this time. I go, but maybe now I have your attention. And I said, maybe now, since there's been a murder at Top Notch, and I asked you guys to investigate that a year ago, year and a half ago, and you knew what was going on there, I said, maybe now you'll investigate Shane Valentine. I said, he's out on bail on a burglary charge. He's got multiple felony convictions from when he was a juvenile and certified up as an adult. 
He's pimped out one judge's daughter. He's pimped out multiple police officers' daughters. He tried to pimp out my daughter. He's targeting certain families. And you guys just don't care. And I said, I have information on a girl who is at this moment working as a prostitute for him while he's out on bail on a burglary. Maybe you could do some investigation and do something about it. So he tells me he'll be at my office on Thursday afternoon. Thursday comes and goes, no call, no show. And what detective was that? So that, that was Detective Kelly Blue. How do you spell the last so, name? How do you spell the last name again? B-L-U-T-H. Bluth. Bluth. Okay. All right. So that following Sunday, coincidentally, I was at the jail doing something else. And I run into LBS working overtime at the jail. And I was not nice. And I walked to him and I said, I have a question. I said, how come you guys keep fucking blowing me off? I go, I've been bringing you information. And these guys trying to pimp out underage girls. I go, which is your big, you know, talking point on the news. And I said, for over a year now. And I go, you guys have just completely blown me off for over a year. You've done nothing. You haven't investigated anything I've told you. You haven't made any effort to independently investigate or verify any of the information I've given you. And now you've got a dead person at a place that I told you about over a year ago that was an unlicensed club. I go, I don't understand. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I go, he goes, oh. And I go, I talked to Blue on Monday. I go, he was supposed to come to my office. And once again, no call, no show. And he said, well, he's out of town. And I go, well, he's got a phone, doesn't he? And so he said, we'll come to your office next week. So the following week, which would have been the first week of October 2016, they come to my office. And it's Albiez, Kelly Bluth, and Greg Flores. And I give them information on a girl. The same girl I told you about earlier, whose dad was a police officer who was friends with my daughter. Okay. I give them her name, her dad's name, all of her information. And again, I give them Shane's information, where he lives, what his story is. Who was the name, ma'am? Who, who, who was the name of the cop whose daughter was being pimped out? His name is Ty Bowden, B-O-W-D-E-N. He goes by Ty, like T-Y, but his first name is Clarence. Now, I had said to them when I gave them this information, every time I gave them information, I said, my daughter can never know I'm giving you information. If she finds out, she'll never talk to me again. I'll never get information again. And, you know, she might just be so pissed off that <laughs> she will never talk to me again anyway. Okay, ma'am, I don't want I don't want you to lose track here, but I just, before I on a train of thought, I want to ask you a question. It's okay. Um, wh I don't understand. Why would a pimp be pimping out daughters of cops and a judge? It seems like the stupidest thing to do in the world. What, why was he doing that? No, actually, if you know you're protected, and it's actually not the stupidest thing in the world. It's the smartest thing in the world because I'm the only one that has ever been willing to come forward because everybody else is A, in denial about the fact that it's happening, or B, cares more about their job, their political career, or their public reputation than their kids. And I had told my daughter in December of 2015, I love my job, I would like to do my job for a long time, but I will lose my job in a heartbeat to save you. And I told her, I go, one of these pimps gets you, I will lose my job, I will lose my freedom, I will lose my life if that's what it takes to get you back. Detective Bowden, uh, I will get you back. Okay, Detective get you. Ty Bowden, what does he do for Metro? Ooh. What is Where does he work? I don't know where he works now. I have no idea. He was a patrol officer at the time. Okay, patrol officer. Okay. But no, here's the thing. you got Molly Mall paying off these cops to protect his people and his girls and go after the other pimps. Right. Shane Valentine works under Molly Mall, so he's protected. It explains, and if you've got these kinds of kids, 
their parents aren't going to come forward because their parents are embarrassed. See, my embarrassment comes from the fact that we have a police department and a DA's office who will allow this to happen. They know it's happening. They pretend they don't. And they allow our kids, they allow their own colleagues' kids to get trafficked. And then they go on the news and talk about their, you know, passion for going after these human traffickers when they're sitting back watching it. I actually subsequently learned that there were cops who hung out at Top Notch at the club. With the underage girls. Mm -hmm. If someone was to talk to Marlon Brown, I'll bet he'd tell him, I actually kind of like Marlon. Marlon actually protected my daughter. Now listen, if my daughter had been 18, I guarantee he wouldn't have. But he used to tell my daughter all the time, he's like, I have mad respect for your mom. She always treated us with respect and we were in court, in court with her. Who is this guy? Which, which guy is this? Who is that guy? He was a pimp. He was the one who owned Top Notch. But he actually, he wouldn't let my daughter drink. He wouldn't let her party. He would let her sit back there and load the hookahs. <laughs> you know, he let her hang out there. But according to him, he uh, kind of shielded her from the other stuff. Uh, you know. I, I'm not, I don't think the guy deserves any freaking awards, but I do appreciate the fact he didn't beat my daughter up and put her out on the strip. His, his first <laughs> name is Marlon? Yeah. Marlon Brown? I mean, he, he protected my daughter more than the cops did, I can tell you that. Who was the judge's name? That's pretty what, sad. What was the judge's name whose daughter was also being pimped out? What was her name? Michelle Levitt. Their daughter recently was working as a prostitute again out of uh, Spearmint Rhino, which is also Molly Mall's territory. So I'm just getting to the good part. <laughs> so I give these guys this information in the beginning of October of 2016, okay? We already had the murder at Top Notch. Then, October 8th of 2016, unbeknownst to me, there is a drive-by shooting at a guy named Neo's house. How do you spell that? Neo is N-E-O. I'm going to look through my stuff real quick and see if I can find it. Okay. <laughs> For whatever reason, it's escaping me. I'm sorry. Um, so, Neo is a kid that was a really, really good kid in high school. Um, he's now hanging out with Shane Valentine. Their buddy and um, hold on a second. And they're doing work buddies together. He also is an up and coming kid. I'm, lo I'm losing your, uh, you're getting distorted for some reason. I don't know if you're walking away from the phone or not. Because I was putting it on my shoulder to try to mix the information. Okay. We have an up and coming pimp at this time. Okay. So, uh, but Neil was taking Shane Valentine's girl, and Shane was getting pissed. So on October 8th, Shane and Neo have a little tip in text messages where Shane threatens Neil and says he's going to come shoot up Neo's house. Neo says, bring it, give him the address and the gate code. And 10 minutes later, Shane Valentine rolls up to Neo's mom's house and ramps the car into the garage with a rental car rented in his name um, and then fires a round into that house and throws a big giant boulder through Neo's mom's window. Okay? So, Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N, is Neo's last name. Neo Kaufman. Okay. So, the police go out. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. There's, Neo doesn't want to cooperate, of course, but you've got three other witnesses, independent witnesses who lived on the street, who give a vehicle description, license plate number, description of the shooter, which matches Shane Valentine. You've got um, the car rented in his name. You've got a piece of the car that fell off in the driveway and you've got Neil's mom who said, who gives the description. 
Metro closes that investigation two days later as insufficient evidence for prosecution. Okay. Uh, uh, Mid-October of 2015, retired Lieutenant Karen Hughes sends me a message on Facebook unrelated to um, this investigation. I had made a ruling in a case and she had complimented my decision in that case. As a result of that, I reach out back to her and I say, I've got a question for you. Now, I, of course, don't realize she's the subject of the investigation either. Okay, just so I just um, want to know, just for, just to get this on the record um, right now, the, the subject of, the, when you say the investigation, we're talking about... The FBI investigation. Right, the FBI investigation reference to the search warrant they executed in 2014 on Molly Mall's house. Correct. Okay. I didn't know at that time that she was the subject of the investigation, or at least, you know, part of the investigation. So I reach out to her and I say, hey, I got a question for you. I said, what's going on in Vice? I said, because I've been taking information to them for over a year now, almost a year and a half. And I said, and they have blown me off over and over and over and over again. I said, I don't understand. I said, maybe they just don't give a shit because it's me. I said, but it's really frustrating and I don't understand. And she says, I'll call over there. She then tells me that she's gonna call over, that she had called over there and it was gonna be taken care of, okay? Right. So, October 25th, 2016, at 4.30 in the afternoon, I get a phone call from Detective Van Cleef and he's frantic. And he says, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, I was asked to sit in on an interview today. He goes, I sit down and the girl comes into the interview and the detective who's questioning her is a detective by the name of Justine Gaddis, G-A-D-U-S. Of all of them, she should not, she should be in prison for what she did to me and my daughter. Who, Justine Gaddis? So, yeah. What'd she do? So, well, I'm going to tell you. Okay. She calls Ty Bowden and says she would like to interview his daughter that they have received information that she is a prostitute or has, you know, is potential, potentially has information with regard to a pimp and human trafficking of juveniles. So they call her in for an interview. Rather than like do independent investigation, right? Because you know, typically teenage girls will admit in front of their police officer dads that they're prostitutes. I'm being sarcastic, clearly. Um, so they bring her in for an interview with her police officer father. First question out of Justine Gaddis's mouth: Do you know Sarah Tobiasen? Yes, I do. She's one of my best friends. Second statement out of Justine Gaddis's mouth. We got your name from her mom. She says you're working as a prostitute for a pimp by the name of Shane Valentine. Jesus. Yeah. Yep. I get the call from Van Cleef, who is beside himself. He goes, I don't know what to do. And I said, how about you get the fuck back in there and fix this? I go, she just put a fucking target on my daughter. I go, you think this guy's gonna kill me? He's not gonna kill me, he's gonna kill my kid. I go, what is wrong with you people? I said, there is no way that this was an accident. I go, no vice detective, I don't care if they've been there for one day, would do that by accident. I go, this was intentional. And I, so he goes back into the interview. He calls me when the interview's over and he's like, well, you know, we talked to her and we told her not to talk to your daughter about it. I go, are you an idiot? I go, she's on the phone with my daughter right now. I go, in fact, I'll bet you in 30 seconds I haven't, a call from my daughter. Sure shit, I get a text message from my daughter. Are you serious? You called the police on us? So I bring my daughter and Ali to my house. I tell them, I go, you guys need to get to the house right now. You're not safe. So you brought your daughter. To the house. You said you hang on. You said you brought your daughter and who to the to your house? Ali, the girl, the daughter of the police officer that they had just outed me to. What's her name? Ali. How do you spell that? 
A L L I E. Okay. So I bring them to my house, and I have to kind of give them the song and dance because I don't really want to tell them yet that, I, you know, I don't want to admit to them at this point that I've been bringing information to the cops because, you know, they're still young and they're still, you know, I don't want to lose my connection with them, especially right now. Right. So I give them a song and dance about why the police would do this. Uh, but I make it very clear to them that they are not safe. And when Van Cleef calls me back, he and Justine want to meet with me and my daughter. And I told them basically, to, uh, you know, I won't tell you what I said, but it wasn't very nice. And I said, you guys have a reason for doing what you did and I don't know what it is I said but if something happens to my daughter we can have a real big fucking problem so that night unbeknownst to me at this time um Allie leaves my house and she tweets she puts out a tweet about the fact that she was called in and questioned by Vice mm -hmm. okay now, unfortunately, at this point, Ali was no longer associated with Shane Valentine. She was associated with Neil Kaufman. And like I said, they had had a beef because Shane was upset that Neil was taking Shane's goals. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that night at about 12.30, so it would have been 12.30, October 26th, 12.30 a.m., uh, Shane Valentine... The guy by the name of Dominique Thompson, he went by Domo, D-O-M-O. And a girl by the name of Frankie, F-R-A-N-K-I-E, Zappia, Z-A-P-P-I-A. What was Dominic's last name? To Thompson. Thompson? Okay. It's Dominique. Dominic? Thompson. Dominique. Dominique. Q-U-E at the end. That's a male, right? Dominic. Okay. It is a male. He's a pimp. His name's Domo. D-O-M-O. -O. Okay. Shane, Domo, and Frankie, whose stepdad is a police officer by the name of Dano, D-A-N-O, Gearsdorf, G-I-E-R-S, D-O-R-S. Go to Neo's house and execute Neo and his girlfriend, Sydney Land, whose dad is a fire captain. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm, oh, hang on, I'm losing here. Who's Darrow Gearsdorf? Dano? Right. Dano. Right. Gearsdorf. He's the stepfather of Frankie Zappia, one of the suspects in the double homicide that happened eight hours after I was outed as a source of information to one of Shane Valentine's prostitutes who had left him and was now working for Neo. Okay. Eight hours later, her new pimp is killed by her old pimp because she puts out on Twitter that she had been called in and interviewed by Vice. They know, and everyone else knows, that this murder happened as a result of what they did that day. So, the first um, detective, so... This happens Tuesday. And who got Bonnie killed? Herself. Who got killed, um, Melanie, in that sh in the shooting? Who did they kill? Neil Kaufman. Neil, the oh. kid that had been doing the burglaries with Shane. Oh, he got killed. He got shot in the head. He got executed. Shot in the back of the head. And his girlfriend, Cindy Lynn. Don't forget, Shane Valentine. Shot up Neo's house October 8th and Metro closed the case as insufficient evidence for prosecution, even though they have three independent eyewitnesses and vehicle descriptions and proof that Shane was there. Okay. And Neil's Kaufman's girlfriend is Sue. What's her name? Sydney, S Y D N E Y, Land, L A N D. She was 20. 20-year-old girl from a good Mormon family whose dad is a fire captain. Jesus. She got shot in the face after she got beat up and drug around and had blood burns all over her. Yeah. Okay? Uh, the fire captain here in Vegas? Yes.
Did she die or she survived? She was from... No, she's dead. It's a double homicide. They shot her in the face. Jesus. How come I... I wonder why I didn't hear about this. Double homicide. You heard about it, maybe. Well, no, because they're covering it up. That's why you haven't heard about it. So has anybody been indicted for this double murder? No, that's what I just said. They're covering it up. I'll finish the story. Yeah, go ahead. So here's what go ahead. I'm not going to interrupt find, you. They find, they find the bodies Thursday morning, two days after they've been killed. They know immediately that Shane is one of the suspects. Okay? Right. They're able to ping his phone at the apartment at the time of the shooting. But here's what they don't do. They don't call me and tell me. So Friday night, they find the bodies Thursday morning. Friday night at midnight, I come home from a concert and my daughter comes to me and she says, Mom, I got to talk to you. She said, you know that double homicide when my friend Neil got shot? I said, yeah. She says, Shane did it. And I don't even ask her how she knows because for some reason all the kids on the street know everything and the cops don't know shit. So I text Detective Van Cleef at midnight on Friday, so it would have been the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th of October. And I was just, you just got the intel on the suspect that that was on the side? And his response is, yeah, yes, I heard about it. Hey, hold on a second. I met, uh, met, uh, say that over again. I, I'm losing you. I guess the phone's not near your mouth or something. Can you hear me now? Uh, you sound distorted for some reason. Well, I, I don't know why. Nothing changed. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you a little better. Okay, go ahead. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, damn, I don't know where I was. You, uh, Friday night, your daughter tells you that chain killed... So I I go, you got any intel on the sus suspect in this double homicide? Knowing that they knew. And he goes, yeah, I heard about that yesterday morning. So I called him and I said, you knew yesterday morning that Shane Valentine was a suspect in this double homicide that happened eight hours after you outed me as a source of information, putting my daughter's life in danger. And you didn't think that maybe I should get a heads up that maybe somebody should have called me and told me that he was a suspect in this double homicide. Mm. And, cause, and I told him Tuesday when I was when I said to him, I go, I go, Shane Valentine is a murder waiting to happen. It better not fucking be my daughter. So within eight hours, I was proven right because Shane Valentine was involved in the double homicide of these two kids. And um, so he says to me, oh, you guys aren't in danger. You know, he's on the run. He's not, he's not worried about you guys. And I said, let me explain something to you. I go, he's already killed two people. You think he gives a shit about two more? I said, and apparently nobody cares about the crimes he commits, so he probably doesn't really have to worry about it. And why do you think that so, nobody cares about the crimes he commits? Because they never investigate them, and he never gets arrested for them, unless, of course, they're on videotape and they can't. I mean, they they had an they had opportunities over and over and over and. I mean, he didn't even get charged in the case with the other judge's daughter, where he was there and he was directing her beating. And why do you think it is? Why, why do you think he's a, why do you think he's protected? Because he works for Molly Noel. He's protected. They've been paid to protect him. Okay, the cops. Yes. By Molly Mall. I mean, you're never going to get them to say that, but yeah. he works for Molly Mall. He is associated with Molly Mall. And what I kept saying was, well, maybe once the, invest, once the federal investigation became public, my theory was, I said, oh, now I understand why they won't arrest Shane Valentine. I said, because they're afraid they'll get Ocean Fleming. He'll probably, you know, dime them out for all the shit that they've done. He's probably got intel on them. I was right. I just was right for the wrong reasons. Did you, man, anyway, did, did, um, okay, go on with the story because I got a couple of questions, but go on. No, I'm just, I'm, it's exhausting. If I told, you know, 
Um, but no, what was the question you were going to ask me? Did, did you ever contact anybody from the FBI and tell them what's going on? We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. Okay. Yes. The answer to your question is yes. And when Metro found out that I was talking to the FBI, um, oh, what's his name? God damn it. He just retired. Hold on. I, um, you, cause if I'm off track, then anyway, he was, yes, I did. And I spoke to somebody for a lengthy period of time. And we spoke on border phones because we were so afraid that the other FBI agents in Metro would find out who, who, that we were talking because he knew that there were people that he worked with at his agency that if they found out we were talking, he'd be shut down. Why was that? So Metro finds out that I'm talking to the FBI and a deputy chief contacts the head of the Las Vegas field office who then calls in the agent that I'm talking to and tells him he's not to talk to me anymore, that I'm a problem, and that Metro's concerned that I'm going to go public with my story. Yes, that's what happened. So, who is, yes, who, who is, who is the deputy yeah. Who is the deputy chief? I can't remember his name right now. and He just retired. He it's, retired because he had a DUI that Joe Lombardo covered up. You're not talking about Todd Fasulo. That's who I'm talking about. Yes, I am. Who now works for Murrah, Steve Wynn. Who, all, who now works for the Wynn, and guess what? The head of the local field office of the FBI is about to go work there, too, because Todd Pizzullo got him a job there. That's the same head of the local FBI office who told his agent not to speak to me anymore. And then I believe that they probably found out that, they, that we were still talking, and he got kicked out of the public integrity unit and sent to the opiate squad. What was the FBI agent's name you were talking to? What was his name? I, well, I'll tell you his name, but you know, I'm trying still to protect him, even though he's not, he won't talk to me now. So now I don't have anybody to talk to. I can't go to Metro. I can't go to the FBI. Well, what was what was I'm his? Like, and I got what was his? I got Joe Lombardo, who's trying to suggest that I'm involved in drug trafficking, and that they're going to file charges against me for interfering with an investigation for telling people not to talk to vice detectives because they're dirty. Mm -hmm. They put an info con out on my car saying they don't put my name, they know it's my car, but they say be on the lookout for this car. Basically, it's involved in a drug trafficking investigation. And how I found this out is I was doing a search warrant for a narcotics detective, and he asked me if I had a certain car still, and I said no, but I just bought this particular car. And he goes, that's weird. We just got this info about this, you know, the same kind of car being involved in drug trafficking. And I go, well, I have the only one in town. What kind and he of? He goes, well, clearly it's not you. What kind and of car goes, is that? Clearly, it's a Dodge Demon. Wow, Dodge Demon, yeah. Uh huh. And so then I talked to an attorney who had talked to Joe Lombardo and advised me that Lombardo was suggesting that I was involved in drug trafficking. And then I realized that, in fact, that was me that they were talking about. And you're I not. I can assure you. And you're not involved in drug trafficking, you, right? I can, I can assure you that I am not involved in drug trafficking. Never have been, and never need to be. Never want to be. I've always joked and said, if I'm ever going to go to prison, I promise you, it's going to be worth it. What, what, and that would not be worth it. What? What? Do you, why do you think Lobato's telling people you, you're involved in drug trafficking? He told this particular attorney that they know that I meet with this guy who has prior drug conviction. And they, they mentioned a place that I meet him, which is a bar in Henderson. I was so pissed off. I go, first of all, I've known that guy since I was 17 fucking years old. I said his priors are from marijuana. And... He's been my friend forever. He builds race cars, and he actually was getting me some estimates. Thank God I have them for one of my other cars to get, like, a supercharger and stuff. But I have a car issue. <laughs> Let me ask you a question again. What, what, I, I, what was the FBI agent's name, just so I get that on the record? Not that I'm going to advertise it, but what was his name? Kevin White. Is he still with the Las Vegas division? 
Yeah, but he got transferred out of political integrity and moved to, uh, or public integrity and moved to the opiate task force, even though he's the one who spearheaded this entire investigation that started in 2014. Okay, let me ask you a question. Because Metro apparently has enough pull to control the FBI behavior here in Las Vegas. What's the question? Uh, I'm writing that down, Metro calls FBI. Mm -hmm. Behavior in Las Vegas. Um, I'm losing track here. Me too. Okay. Listen, um, listen, listen, I can tell you this. This story is five more hours, so we're not going to get it all done today. Um, Metro controls FBI investigation. Okay. Do you know, do you have any information that that FBI investigation, the alleged FBI investigation, because I did a story on it that it started by George Knapp, do you really think there is an FBI investigation going on since 2014, or you think it's just a bunch of nonsense? Well, according to Kevin White, there is, and according to him, there's going to be, well, I shouldn't say that, but listen, everybody in the world is saying there's going to be indictment. Right. But they started saying they were coming out in February. Then March, then April, now it's May, and I don't see any fucking indictment. And everybody keeps saying, don't worry, once the indictments come out, you're going to be okay. You'll be safe. I go, I should be safe now. I go, but I'm not, because I can't call the police, and I can't call the FBI. I go, where the fuck do I go if something goes wrong? Okay, I now, go, who do I call? now, according to rumor, um, some of the people who may be indicted are, of course, Bauman, the former vice cop, um, from what I heard. Lieutenant Karen Hughes retired. Uh, Bias, Bias, and maybe some people from criminal intelligence and other people from vice that are still on there. That's, that's what I'm hearing. But again, that's based on rumor. Listen, I don't have, I do not have information on who might be indicted. I mean, I have theories, um, I have suggestions that it's going to be way bigger than anybody thinks it's going to be, and that it's going to be way more people than anybody realizes it's going to be, but by the time they finally get the indictments out, I may be in prison for bullshit charges <laughs> from Joe Lombardo. I mean, let me finish because then you'll understand. A lot of times the questions that are asked get answered. Right. But it, I promise you this story is so long and so convoluted and so complicated. You understand it because you have an understanding. But there are so many weird twists and turns. Um, anyway, so these murders happen. The first detective who is investigating the case, thank God, is someone who knows me and respects me and I have a good relationship with. He tells me for the first three or four weeks after the murders, while Shane Valentine is on the run, what information they have and what proof they have that Shane's involved. And they have his phone pinging at the apartment and then what happens is after the murders, the phone is turned off almost immediately. And then the next time his phone is turned on, it's in Baker, California. So he turns his phone off as soon as the murders are committed and then turns it back on in Baker. They wind up catching him sometime later in, um, Burbank, California, sleeping in, lo and behold, the same rental car that he was in when he shot up Neo's house, okay? Now, after the double homicide, they get Neo's phone, and there's like 40,000 text messages on it. Apparently, Neo never deleted his text. And there's text messages between <coughs> Neo and Shane. There's text messages between Ali and Neo confirming that she is has an involvement with Neo, prostitution-related involvement with Neo. And there are many, many, many other text messages on this phone, but I'm advised of this by the detective working the case, that they have this information. They therefore reopen the drive-by shooting 
at Neo's mom's house on October 8th and subsequently filed charges against Shane for that, okay? Um, even though they didn't have enough evidence before. So, but they really did. But I'm told that they have Domo's DNA, that Frankie's phone pings at the apartment, that they caught Frankie in all kinds of lies. And one of the most significant things is that after the two are dead, nobody ever texts them again. Like Shane and Frankie and Domo never send them another text. You know, like they know they're dead. Right. You know, I mean, you know how these kids are. They text each other 527,000 times a day. Right. They never send another text. So there's a lot more information about how they know that Shane's involved, but they know. So Shane gets arrested in California. He gets extradited back to California or back to Vegas. He gets charged with the drive-by shooting. And I find out from the homicide detectives that there are four other, now mind you, he's been out on bail on a burglary charge since May. And then the murders are committed in October. There were four other burglary cases that were sitting in the DA's office that had DNA and fingerprints that tied Shane Valentine to those burglaries that they never filed. He's out on bail on a burglary they closed the drive-by shooting case that they knew he did. And they got four other cases where they have DNA and fingerprints and they don't file and revoke his bail. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then there's a lieutenant who tells me that they believe he's good for 600 burglaries during that time frame where he was out on bail. That lieutenant was it was actually a captain, I'm sorry, Captain Ray Buck, Todd Ray Buck. Okay? He was a lieutenant when I talked to him and then he got promoted to captain when he wrote the memo, which I will provide to you. Okay. So there's a significance to them having the text messages between Ali, the girl they outed me to, the cop's daughter, right. and Neo. Because at this point in time, they now know that Ali is, is in fact a prostitute. Because what they tried to do after the interview is they tried to tell me that she was not, that she didn't even know who Shane Valentine was, and that it was in fact my daughter who had introduced her to Shane Valentine. And I wasn't in a position to argue with them or even have discussions with them because they had outed me. <laughs> so um, once those murders happen, they learn that in fact she is. But here's what happened. I make a phone call to somebody who I know is tight with the sheriff. And I said, I have a story to tell you that I think the sheriff needs to know about. And I tell him the story that I just told you. And he tells the sheriff. And the sheriff calls in homicide. And the burglary detectives who never did a search warrant, never really followed up on the information I gave them, calls in the officers who closed the drive-by shooting case. And he basically makes it look to me like he's doing something. Who was the guy when that you, who was the guy that you told or told the sheriff? Kirk Hooten. Who? Kirk Hooten. Kirk Hooten. Is it what what what, what what rank is he? Right now he works for the PPA and I don't I think he's just he's not a sergeant or anything. He's just uh the guy Okay. You ready for me to move on? Um, I'm, I'm so, moving. Uh, okay. Sometimes, sometimes your voice fades out. I don't know why, but I got you. I think now. 
Try it again. All right. Can you, yeah, now, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Kirk Hooten, right? Did you, Kirk Hooten, H-O-O-T-E-N. And he's a, uh, a, a sergeant on Metro? No, I say he's not. I don't think he's from, I don't know what his rank is. I don't think he's promoted to anything. He's just a friend of Joe Lombardo's. He's now works at the uh, PPA. Okay, the LB PPA. So he's just a regular cop. Okay. As far as I know, I don't know. Okay. He's been there forever, but he's kind of, he's like Joe's best friend. Okay. So I go to him, I tell him, he takes it to Joe. Joe calls in the homicide detective. Joe calls in um, the uh, burglary detective. He calls in the vice detective, asks them why they, you know, what they did in response to my information and they basically tell him that the only thing they ever did was walk into top notch one time acknowledge to him that it clearly was not a legitimate business and then acknowledge to him that they did nothing else even though they knew it was not a legitimate business Okay. What so, what time frame are we talking about here that they this guy went to Lombardo? What month and year are we talk about? It was within a week that I found out about Shane being a suspect. So that was um, 2016, what month? November. Okay. So then he has the conversation with them. He then sets up a meeting with me. I go in there. A meeting with you and, and you, you. with you and Joe Lombardo? Yes. Okay. So, um, but prior to that, I'm I'll backtrack a little bit. So I told you about the cop whose daughter was a suspect in the double homicide. Right. He's a piece of shit. I knew him before he was a cop. When he became a cop, I was concerned. There's theories, and I can't prove them, that he was actually feeding girls to the pimps and that he was every bit as, I mean, he is as dirty as they come. And I will tell you this, he, uh, he retired four days after the double homicide. And what was his name again? Dano Gearsdorf. Okay. He, his other stepdaughter is also a prostitute and very significant to this story. Um, that's where it gets a little complicated. Hold on. Okay, down here. Okay, just checking. Um, oh, but before we go any further, let me ask you a question. Uh, are you married or are you single? I'm married. Who, are you married to a, a, a Metro cop? He's retired. And no, he didn't help me. He's, he's not helping you? <laughs> He hasn't helped me through any of this. I was the one who went to Shane Valentine's house kicking the door. I was the one who went to the cop. I was the one who followed my daughter. I was the one who made sure she was safe. No, he didn't help me. Why not? What does he think about all this? I can't ask, I can't answer that question for you. Because he probably thought I was nuts. Because he probably judged my daughter rather than wanting to save her. Um, because we're just two very different kinds of people. He'd rather put his head in the sand like everybody else, and that's just the way it is. And is his name is, yeah. is his name Tobiasen? That's his name. Yeah, it's, his first name's Todd. His last name's Tobiasen. Yeah, I don't know him. Um, I heard of the name, but I don't, I don't know him personally. He's a nice guy. He just, you know, he doesn't. He just like he's like ninety percent of the rest of the population. He's a sheep. Right. He just allows this shit to happen and just kind of accepts or believes that it's not really as bad as it is. Okay. You know, it is what it is. It's not really relevant to this, so. Let, let, let me let me ask you a question. Um, just maybe you know, maybe yeah. you know, maybe you don't know. Do you think the reason why, um, because that's a little puzzling to me, is why the FBI guy was told not to talk to you? Because of the of the uh, ongoing FBI corruption probe, and thought maybe you may jeopardize that investigation no. somehow. No, no, they told him specifically. 
I am a problem for Metro. Metro's afraid I'm going to go public. And it would make Metro look bad. No, it had nothing to do with them being concerned that it would compromise the investigation. I was giving them information that bolstered their investigation. These guys are covering for Metro, just like Metro's covering for Metro. But, okay, what, okay. I'm, I'm trying to find the connection here, though. Why would the FBI be covering for Metro during a federal corruption probe? That, well, that's the part that doesn't make any sense. This is a different, this is different. This is a t completely different investigation. The thing I'm involved in, although it's tied to Molly Mall, resulted in three murders that are not being investigated, that are not part of that investigation. They ignored me for a year and a half, and it resulted in three murders. And I was giving that information to the FBI in hopes that at some point they might investigate that as well, whether it had a connection to the ongoing investigation or it resulted in an additional investigation. I was providing them information on my situation in hopes that they would investigate it. And they shut their, their agent down and told him he was to stand down, not to speak to me anymore. This was, they were not investigating this. They were not going to take the information on it. And he was not to speak to me anymore. Do, do, do you think by talking to that agent that, aside from the stuff that you just told me about the murders, do you think there was an active investigation with the FBI going on, on the other, on Molly Ball? Yes. Okay, but they didn't want to hear anything I mean, about. Only there was. But they, they didn't don't want. Okay. Listen, they're still protecting them. They're going to try to, you know, listen. Bachman's gone from the department. Karen Hughes is gone from the department. Albia should be, but they're still. Metro was able to call it. I don't care why. It doesn't matter why. Metro finds out that a judge is giving information to the FBI and is able to call the FBI and tell their agent not to get information from the judge anymore about the prostitution activities that she reported to Vice that were ignored and resulted in three murders. It doesn't matter why. The fact it happened is the story. It's okay. Who cares what their motivation is? It's disgusting. Why would they not want me to give information to the FBI about this? Because it makes them look really fucking bad. And they know that the fact that they outed me got two people killed. They weren't the two people they were trying to get killed, me and my daughter. But it got two people killed. How do you, let me ask you, I'll tell you, Joe does not want this story out there. Okay, let me ask you a question. How did you make contact with this FBI agent that you originally talked to? Did he approach you or you approached him? I approached him and it was the most bizarre. I had dinner with a lady who runs a group called Sesame. And it's a group that, fought, you know, that keeps track of teachers who are accused of or convicted of having inappropriate relationships with students and then just get sent to a different jurisdiction and right. get their teaching licenses, kind of like priests. Right. And during the, and we had, you know, we had a different issue that we were dealing with. And I had dinner with her and I tell her this story. And she says, I have a friend who's an FBI agent who is, who works on human trafficking and political or public integrity. She goes, he, he probably really want to talk to you. And I said, I'll talk to him. I said, I've t thought about going to the FBI for a while now. I said, but I don't know exactly how to go about doing that. And so she sent him a text and she said, I'm having dinner with somebody who would like to talk to you. They have a story for you. And he said to her, give her my number. And I, that's how we made contact. 
Okay. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm just going to give you my opinion here for a second, not for what it's worth anything, but, you know, I got a little bit of background because of stuff that I was involved in with the police department years ago when the FBI was doing an investigation. Now, I'm, I'm just saying what it sounds like to me, and I don't know, I'm just giving you my opinion here, is that okay. the reason why that FBI agent was told to stop talking to you because of the ongoing corruption investigation the FBI's yeah. got against Metro, and they didn't want anything at that point to disrupt it. I'm, no. You know, no, because it's, you know what I'm saying. Metro does not control the FBI. That's that's I'm telling you. I'm telling you, they control the at the local office. In fact, that FBI agent said to me, if I was in any other field office in the country, and a local police department called my thought and were upset about me talking to somebody. They would tell him to go get fucked. He said, this is the only field office in the entire country where the local police department can call and complain and get the agent shut up. I think we said that to me. So with all due respect, you're wrong on this one. The FBI agent personally said that he was, he then gave me a burner phone that he bought because he didn't want one in my name. We then spoke on burner phone. And now Joe Lombardo, one of his reasons for suggesting I'm involved in drug trafficking right. is because he knows I have burner phones. And I said to the attorney, I go, really? I go, let me tell you something. I never had a burner phone in my life until I talked to the FBI. I go, the only reason I've ever had a burner phone is so that Metro and the FBI wouldn't know I was talking to an FBI agent. That's why I have a burner phone. Let me ask you a question, uh, Melanie. Um, I saw the interview that you did with um, Channel 8 I-Team. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is everything that's on that interview is what you told them, or was that an edited version of your interview? Oh, no. That interview, that tape was never intended to be public. I made that tape to, in the event that I was dead and couldn't tell my story. My attorney wanted me to videotape my story. It's about four hours, maybe five, in the event that someday I needed it for my protection. Or in the event that I wasn't around to tell the story. That's how concerned they are for me. Then what happens after that? So, you have Lombardo, and I didn't find out about it till after the story aired, talking to my attorney, suggesting that I'm involved in criminal activity and suggesting that they're going to file charges against me. And my attorney tells me, I think we need to do the story. He doesn't tell me why. He just says, I think we need to air the story. Right. I said, I agree. I said, I don't know what the fuck we're waiting for. Let's do it. I wanted to do it six months ago. And so they aired the story. And that was on April, response, April 13th when they aired it. Yes. Have you in got... response to the, hold on, let me just finish. In response to the airing of that story, five days later, Joe Lombardo, Steve Wilson, the district attorney, Chris Lawley and Robert Daskus, the two assistant district attorneys, and a guy by the name of Jim La Rochelle, who is Joe Lombardo's personal lieutenant, have a secret meeting with my chief judge, who's the chief judge on Las Vegas Justice Court, trying to get me kicked out of my criminal calendar, but they want it to be a secret. They don't want me to find out about it. They want Joe Bonaventure, the chief judge, to come to me and say that he saw the news story and he thinks it creates an appearance of a bias against the police department and the DA's office. Right. And he's losing me to all civil cases. Well, he doesn't do that. He advises me about the meeting. And he tells me that as long as I say, I go, I don't have a bias against the police department. I said, I feel sorry for the other 95% of the officers who have to work with the 5% that are corrupt and the sheriff. 
I said, in no way do I think the entire police department is corrupt. I go, I think they're terrified, you know, but so I find out about the meeting and then an article gets written about it. Joe Lombardo has a meeting with George Knapp where his veins are popping out of his neck because he's so mad. Right. And he's accusing me of being inappropriate. But he's yelling at George Knapp for doing the story because it makes them look bad. And that's where we're at. So Joe Lombardo is so angry that God only knows what he's going to try to do. But their meeting was so inappropriate that I've had three attorneys tell me that I should file a federal lawsuit. Now, that is not what I want to do. I have no interest in that. Here's what I have interest in. Something happening that shows what these guys have been doing or not doing that allows these girls to get trafficked. That's what I care about. Okay, but in the... In the, it, at some point, Shane, Shane um, what's his last name again? Val, Valentine. Valentine. Okay, he's in prison right now. They did lock him up. Yeah. Okay. They just negotiated all of his five burglaries and the drive-by shooting right. for three years. Okay, so when they come back... He'll be out. He'll be out before my daughter turns 21. And you need to understand my daughter's terrified of when he gets out of prison. Okay, because I Not saw... That he couldn't kill her from prison. But. I saw the response in the paper um, mm -hmm. referenced the I-Team uh, story, and then um, I guess they did a, a print version, and in there they said, yeah. when they talked to Joe Lobato, he said their response was, basically, we did our job. Vice arrested no, Shane is. Valentine, Valentine, and he's now in prison, which is true. He is in prison. Vice has never arrested Shane Valentine. Never. Vice has never. Homicide reopened the drive-by shooting. Okay. And he pled to a burglary because they found out after he was a suspect in the double homicide that he had four burglaries sitting at the DA's office that they never filed. Even though he was out on bail on another burglary, they had four with DNA and fingerprints that they never filed. Um, I got to look at the charges, but he wasn't charged um, and convicted of the murders? Nobody has been arrested in the murders. I told you that. He... They, he was a suspect in the murders. They have all the evidence they need to make arrests in the murders. It's, well, see, you start asking me questions, and we got off track. And right. I answer, but it's, I'm telling you, it's complicated, and it will take more than this. because. Of, but I told you about the detective who was originally on the case and told me all the evidence they had that showed it was Shane, Domo, and Frankie. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. A month after the double homicide, they appoint, they take him off the case. That never happens. If you start a murder case, you finish a murder case, unless you retire. They take him off the case. They make another detective the lead detective. His name is Mitch Dosh. Guess who he lives by? Guess he lives on the same street as Dan O'Gearsdorf. You know why? Because he and Dan O'Gearsdorf have been friends for 30 years and bought houses together on the same street. You know how I know this? Because Dan O'Gearsdorf's other stepdaughter told me this. So now the detective on the case who says that Shane Valentine is the only suspect until he says otherwise has done nothing. I have all the text messages between him and Sidney Lamb's mom where he says, we have other murder cases to work on. We'll get back to your daughters eventually. Now, one week, one week after they found out I was talking to the FBI, they did a press conference where they said Shane Valentine is no longer a person of interest in this murder. That was one year and three weeks after the murder happened. And up until the minute they found out I was talking to the FBI, Shane was a suspect. 
The minute they found out I was talking to the FBI, they do a press conference saying he's not a suspect. The problem is they don't know that I know what evidence they have. Chances are they've destroyed it by now. Hmm. And the vice detective who's investigated the vice angle of this has known Dan Gearsdorf since before they moved to Las Vegas and became police officers. He, in fact, is Dan Gearsdorf's other stepdaughter's godfather. I know, it's hard to process it all. Well, I got pretty much everything you said. The, the missing link here is... There's more. Um, I mean, there's a lot more. I'm, I'm still having a very hard time to believe because public integrity investigations are norm are not normally they are they're handled out of headquarters out of Washington and then agents are come out. Well, they weren't. Um, norm the normally not here. You know, the public integrity section is, is based out of Washington. Here's but, what but I go can ahead. tell you. Go ahead. Here's what I can tell you. They have now taken it away from the field office here. Well, that's because what, of what happened. That's what I was saying. That should this they, this should be coming right out of headquarters. That's where the the public integrity well, section works out of. It wasn't originally. It was being investigated here. They took it away from them because of what happened. When was that? With do you know? Them only within the last few months. And this is information I get from people who really aren't supposed to be talking to me. Right. But they tell me. And now I got Lombardo threatening to file charges against me because, you know, I have the nerve to speak out. And what do you think he's going to charge you with? If you don't, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not doing nothing, he, he can't, he can't, he can't make I up know. charges. I, he told my attorney he was going to charge me with interfering with an investigation because there were certain conversations apparently I've had with people where I said you probably shouldn't talk to certain detectives because they're dirty. And my attorney said, um, first of all, you're not doing an investigation. We've even been told that the case is cold. Second of all, it's true. Why would you suggest to somebody to talk to a detective that you know is dirty? Right. So, I mean, he's just trying to scare me. When, when they told you, and, you know, when they told you, Melanie, that um, the case was taken out of the local office, did they tell you where it was going? Washington. Okay, because that's where I figured it should have been from the start. Um, well, it wasn't there from the start, I can assure you. Because when I was involved with all that stuff years ago back in the police department, it was the public integrity section at a headquarters that gives the authority to do these investigations in town. I'm, but, uh, but, I'm just telling you, it, it wasn't. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, I know that it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand how somebody at Metro could call the FBI and get me basically blackballed so I can't talk to an FBI agent who was very interested in my story and knew that I was telling the truth. I don't understand that either. That does sound a little um, mysterious to me. Um, it's real mysterious. I, I've never heard of that, and I, I said I've, I've done a lot of different things in the well, past 40 years this. where the FBI agent that I was talking to right is so he will not talk to me he's so afraid to talk to me because he knows he'll get fired or he'll get I mean it's that it's listen he's as mind blown as I am he's afraid to talk on his phone his work phone because he doesn't trust the other agents he works with I'm not crazy, okay? No, I don't think you're crazy. He's told me, I mean, he and I talked at length. We would meet at churches and libraries so we could talk. He was terrified to be seen with me in public because he knew they wouldn't want me talking to him. Right. Once he knew what I, once he knew my story, he knew what would happen if they found out that we were talking. And he was right. He was absolutely, he, 
told me what would happen if they found out we were talking, they found out we were talking, and exactly what he said would happen, happened. So, you know, whether it makes sense to you or not, what it should say to you is this is bigger than I ever, you know, this is stuff that they really, 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 really don't want to become public. That's what it should say to you, is that this shit is huge. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind just what you told me. If, if the FBI knew half of what you're saying, this is a major federal corruption investigation. That's there. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm, I will honestly say that that I don't care what anybody thinks about the FBI or nothing. I'm telling you that personally, and I don't have any information on this, but I, I told somebody the other day, I because they asked me about why it's taken so long for this federal corruption probe since 2014. I'm saying those things could take years, and I'll tell you why, because if it starts out is vice cops being involved with pimps as, as, as why when the FBI hit Molly Ball's house they did not notify Metro because they didn't trust Metro so they did the investigate they did the thing themselves now I believe since then and I don't have any direct knowledge of this that this has gone far beyond just corruption in the vice unit yeah. and and I think yeah. that's why Joe Lombardo is probably a nervous wreck specifically having Aaron Rouse standing next to him during six months when he was doing those interviews to the thing. He was a nervous wreck, but th this is I, I still believe this is a, a major federal corruption probe, and it is being conducted by the public integrity section of the FBI that's usually run out of Washington, then they send agents out here and do it. But I think it's gone far beyond, I think it's gone far beyond, Melanie. I don't think, I think it's way... One of the last times I spoke to this agent before he quit calling me, and I will tell you this, he's gotten me and he's gotten messages to me to let me know that I'm okay, that you know he knows what's going on, he knows I'm scared, and you know he's managed to get me messages, but he also got me the message that if they ask him if he's talked to me, he doesn't want to have to lie. No, he's got to tell him the truth. He's got to tell him and the truth. So and then, then you... Why he, that, and then you... That's why he's refusing to talk to me, because he doesn't want, you know... And But, but what does that tell you? That he's afraid of them finding... You know what I mean? Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure that when the way it's being relayed may be the way it is. I mean, I believe you when you said that um, if Metro contacted the FBI and said, "Hey, let me, let me tell you this right now, Metro, I don't care, I don't care what you believe, man. I'm telling you, Metro is not going to tell the FBI to knock off a federal corruption probe. That is just a bunch of nonsense." Oh, I, no, 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 no. You misunderstood me. I did not say that they said to stop the probe. I'm telling you, they did not want me giving this agent the additional information that I have. This thing with me is a completely separate but huge issue for Metro because it involves judges and police officers and fire chief and human trafficking and the allowing of it to happen to our children, the ignoring of it, when somebody brought it to their attention repeatedly, and then the murders. Now, where I didn't go, see, there's so much information that, hold on, I think my son's coming downstairs, and I will not have, I will not discuss this in front of my kids anymore, because no. it just, my daughter is scared. She had an incident at her house the other night. She's not convinced it was unrelated, and the police had to come, a lady was trying to kick in her door, was screaming for help, but, you know, was crazy. And the police came, and you know what my daughter was afraid of? What? My daughter's afraid because the police know what, that she's my daughter and where she lives. Mm -hmm. She's more afraid of the police knowing where she lives than the crazy lady who was trying to kick in her door. Okay. Let, let, let me tell you something, Judge. Mm -hmm. um, just, this is just my perspective from being involved in a ton of stuff over the years, okay? If if mm -hmm. if I was an F the FBI, 
and I was conducting a federal corruption probe on a major police department like Las Vegas, Metropolitan Police Department, and in the middle of this investigation, I find out that there is an FBI agent who's talking to somebody who has information that's probably that's no doubt in my mind is part of their investigation, the probe, if, if you believe that or not. They told this guy to stop talking to you because they're afraid something's going to jeopardize the investigation they have ongoing. I could see that happening. I mean, I'm telling you, I've seen it happen before. It's not to say... I understand what you're saying. Right. It's not to say that the investigation... What I'm saying... Go ahead. Is that Pasulo called the head right. of the Las Vegas field office right. he... and advised them that this guy was talking to me and he was then set, told to stop talking to me by the head of the local field office. Right. I, I agree with. I don't. I don't. I don't. I do not believe that that that's a lie. I believe that's the honest to God truth. And I think look at it from. On the, one second. Hey, babe. Do you want to go eat? Where do you want to go? Well, let me go change. All right. Okay, look at it from this. Look at it from my perspective. I'm doing I'm, all kinds of investigations so. with. Okay, listen. Look, look at it from my perspective, Melanie. Yeah. Okay, this is what I think. Yes, I believe absolutely that Fasulo probably called up the FBI and said, "Hey, she's talking to this one. I would tell you guy to knock it off." I don't think the FBI knocked off anything. I think what they did was, and I don't have any proof of this, but I, I know the way it worked. I, I think see what, what you're saying. Right. They, I see what you're they, saying. They went to that agent and said, listen, stop contacting this judge or you're going to be in trouble. And they didn't tell him why. Because with the, what you're saying here with all this stuff, I'm 100% sure that is part of the FBI corruption investigation. I think it's gone way... Go. Listen... It wasn't until I gave this information to him, and I didn't ever give it to him in an official capacity. Well, but, but, all right, but let, me, never, but let me tell you this, okay? You don't know that for sure. And why am I saying this? Because I can almost guarantee you right now that the, the information that you told this FBI agent, I believe they already had. And why do I believe that? Because no, I... Well, let me finish what I'm saying, okay? The reason why this investigation is taking so long since 2014, because they have already talked to, I'm telling you, this is the way it works, they have already talked to cops who were targets, and I believe some of those cops have cooperate, cooperated with the FBI, <laughs> and... They were, the what? There's no doubt about it. They have talked to cops. Right. They have talked to, you know, of course they have. Right. So I think they've with, talked to all kinds of people. Right. So I think what the FBI did to this agent is say, listen, they're not going to tell him why. Stop talking to her. And, and that's just it. Not just like stop talking to her because we want to cover it up. Stop talking to her because it may jeopardize what they're already doing. I, what I believe is this. I believe that investigation... Okay, the way it's supposed to, mm -hmm. so it doesn't really matter. But there's a lot more information on my stuff that I can give you if you're interested in it. Yes. Um, you know, I told you about the meetings with the sheriff after the murders. Right. Uh, the lieutenant in Vice wrote a memo that was completely inaccurate and false. Right. Without speaking to me first. She never asked me what happened. She never spoke to her when I spoke to them. I'm going to have to go after this because I'm going to okay. dinner with my son okay. and then we can talk again maybe tomorrow. But long story short is I had never reported this. And the reason I didn't, and the reason I didn't go public is I was trying to protect my daughter. Right. And I didn't want, you know, and that's why when you say it seems stupid to target kids like mine, no, because most people don't want to go public. The difference between me and everybody else mm. is... I don't care what it does to my reputation. I don't care what they try to do to me as a result of going public, and they are going to try to do stuff to me. It's clear because Joe Lombardo's already threatened it. But I wrote memos back that I had to because she put my daughter's name in a memo in writing. My name, the other judge's name, the other judge's daughter's name, the police officer's name, the police officer's daughter's name. And as a result, I had to write a response. I went to my attorney and said, what do I do? I go, this is all bullshit. And he says, if you don't write a response, explain it. 
explaining everything you've done, they will leak this eventually, and this will it'll ruin you because it's inaccurate. Mm. So I wrote responses, and then Ray Buck wrote a summary, and then Blues Biaz and the Lieutenant Trish Spencer got kicked out of ICE, and now Blues is on Homeland Security, which is doing their own internal investigation of the corruption in vice, run by one of the vice guys who's being investigated. BS has at least three IAB complaints dismissed, or he got 40 hours for admitting that he had sex with multiple prostitutes. 40 hours. I think I get 40 hours for stuffing their children. Um, you know, it's like... And then um, Trish Spence was kicked off the captain's list and sent to Southeast Graveyard. She had now just been promoted to captain. So Julie Gardner basically made it, you know, thought that I was dumb enough to believe that when these people got kicked out and got punished, they were going to get punished. Now they're all right backwards in on the place. But they're, you know, I mean, the reality is, what should have happened and what did happen are two entirely different things. And, you know, now they're trying to cover up the homicide where Shane Valentine is a suspect. And I believe the reason that Metro does not want this to come out is because if the entire story comes out, it's going to be clear that their behavior on that day, in this case, a created, you know, allowed for these men to continue to target our kids, not just judges and cops, but a lot of kids. It's not just our kids, but, you know, our kids were involved. They allowed it to happen. They knew it was happening. In fact, in Trish Spencer's memo, she says that the first time they ever knew Shane Valentine was in September of 2016. They blatantly lied saying that they never knew Shane Valentine's name prior to that. Okay? Okay. Anyway, I sent you those memos. You can read them. There's a lot more here. I guess there, listen, I don't know how the FBI works. I don't trust any of them. I can tell you that. I don't trust the FBI. I don't trust Metro. I don't trust anybody. God help me if I need the police because they're not going to help me, I'm sure. Um... You know, I'm paranoid because I don't do anything, you know, like the worst thing I do is maybe have two drinks and drive home, Right. Um, which, not, you know, I can't do now because I know I'm being followed. I mean, what's really sickening is that I've not done anything wrong. I've provided information. I tried to get the cops to do something. And now that I'm speaking out, I'm being followed and threatened with criminal charges. What? I mean, what? It's just um, disgusting. What, what is it? Um, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? How? How can I help you? Do you want me to? I don't know. I mean, I'd love to get the story down a lot more. I mean, I've got another two hours to fill in because there's more stuff that's happened. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Okay. No, no. Go, go ahead, Melanie. You, um, I, I will call you back. Um, the what? And then maybe I said process this, and then maybe we can talk again tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back tomorrow if you got time. To talk. We can do it the next day. But let me look at all the stuff. But uh, let me put it okay. this way, Melanie. I don't disbelieve what you told me, because um, a lot of this is kind of fitting in with other things I've heard from different people. Uh -huh. But. Um, but uh, I, I'm pretty confident right now, I know a lot of people like, yeah, I'm pretty confident that there is a federal corruption probe going on. And, and I, be, I believe it's gone way beyond the vice squad. I really do. And I can't say anything on the phone why I believe that, but I, I believe it has gone way okay, beyond vice squad. But I um, no, I don't disbelieve you. I think this is good information. A lot of stuff which you told me, I kind of heard bits and pieces from other sources. So it's it's all right. kind of fitting in place. So anyway, enjoy your dinner with your kids. If... um. Uh, you want me to give you my cell phone number, or you don't want to have that? I can just call you back on the burner phone. Is that better for you? No, I mean you can give it to me in, in the event that I need to contact you. Okay. Um, 
and I'll be, you know, I'll be careful with that. Okay. Oh, I don't, I don't care. I got no problem with you careful with that. I don't care. I'm not afraid of anybody. Okay. So it is what it is. The cell phone number is 702-912-1500. Nine one two eight one six two, and my email, if you want to email at me anything, is d o u g p p o p p a at gmail dot com. Doug Papa at gmail dot com. D o u g p o p p a. If you get something from e ticket eight 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 at gmail, that's me. Okay, I'll make note of it. Okay, and if you want, I'll send you these um, uh, memos later. Yes, yeah, so send me send me anything okay. any, anything you have that you want to send me to corroborate any of the stuff. Okay. Just send me all the information you can. Okay. Thanks, Melanie. You bet. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Time is twenty fifty hours on May seventh, twenty eighteen. Turning off the recording at this time. This is Doug Papa.